Meanwhile, another busy day for British soldiers in the town of Basra. Let's check now with William Lajeunesse in Kuwait City, who's been following that ongoing story. Hello, William. Hey, Brian, indeed, you know, the war in many ways entered a new phase on Sunday when British tanks rolled into Basra. Saddam's regime on the run chased out of Iraq's second largest city. Now, the tanks came crashing into Basra from several different directions, the north, the south, and the west. Hundreds of armored vehicles and all told 10,000 men. Resistance surprisingly light. Small arms fire ineffective against those heavy tanks. Also at the Naval College, they found, quote, dozens of surface-to-surface -surface missiles, including some French Exocet anti-ship missiles. The Brits success, a vivid example of the Iraqi government losing control, soldiers giving up, and the Ba'ath Party losing its iron grip. Now, the tank unit did hit the Ba'ath Party headquarters. Soldiers there kicked down doors. They tossed in grenades. Everyone inside was dead or gone. The Republican Guard units have been eliminated. Paramilitary forces reduced from 3,000 to just 300. While Basra, the war is not over. Coalition control is in many areas of that city, and it is only a matter of time before the city falls. Now, the Brits' best weapon so far has been these cheering faces. Those who welcomed the arriving soldiers, they mob Marines, jumped on tanks, delirious with joy, saying, what took you so long? In the last 10 days, citizens of Basra provided the Brits with their best intelligence on the Fedayeen, allowed the U.S. to call in airstrikes on command and control centers, and also limited raids on the uh, military and party leaders over several different nights. Now, the Brits' strategy does offer some tactical lessons for the United States efforts in Baghdad. The Brits were patient, they were methodical, and they were very opportunistic. When they saw it, they took it. They also tried to win over the population using, of course, the uh, checkpoints. They took off their helmets when they could. They wore berets. They offered people food. They did not blockade any of the roads, which are more intimidating than just checkpoints. The bottom line is that strategy did avoid large-scale urban fighting, although it did take almost about three weeks. Now, finally, um, near Zubair, that investigation into the uh, makeshift morgue, if you will, into the uh, hundreds of coffins there that were filled with body uh, parts and bones. Um, that contrary to the initial inspection, forensics experts now say the remains appear to be Iraqi and Iranian soldiers from the mid-1980s. Now, finally, uh, Brian, something that probably describes the desperation that the Iraqi government is feeling more than anything else in the London Guardian today, they're reporting a 52-year-old man was confronted with by the Iraqi Special Operations Unit. They said they will kill him, the Brits will kill him, or he'll have to kill himself. He was forced into becoming a suicide bomber. He said, quote, and I'm quoting, I don't want to attack because I hate Saddam. I'm a Muslim and killing people is against my religion. But they gave me no choice. He walked up to the gate at the Commando 45 Brigade down in, in Basra, but he gave himself up. That follows two suicide uh, bombers, if you will, who were killed two days ago in Baghdad wearing the same clothing and wearing the same headband as some other suicide bombers about four days ago. So it does indicate that they may have no army and they have very few paramilitary, but that Fedayeen is at least drafting people, forcing them into situations where they have to become suicide bombers. Back to you, Brian. All right, thank you, William. And uh, once again, we are following the details we just heard from our Greg Kelly uh, in Baghdad in a tank headed downtown. Uh, that is being backed up by a report from the Reuters wire service. Allow me to read, if I can, a column of U.S. tanks and armored vehicles have launched an attack on central Baghdad. A U.S. officer told Reuters on Monday, we're attacking right down in the center of the city right now, said Major Michael Birmingham, Chief Public Affairs Office for the U.S. 3rd Infantry. That's the unit that Greg Kelly is with, quote, the other day was just an incursion. This is for real, he said, referring to a foray of U.S. armed forces made into Baghdad on Saturday. Once again, Greg Kelly is with that unit. We are trying to reestablish our communications with him. Things are happening, folks. You don't want to leave. Stay with us. It looks like it's going to be an interesting night. Right now, let's go back to New York and Allison Camerata. Thanks, Brian. We want to follow up now on those terrorist incidents that William Law Janess was just mentioning. Joining me from Philadelphia is terrorism expert and senior researcher with the anti-terror think tank, The Investigative Project, Evan Coleman. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay, so these latest suicide bombings that we've seen in Iraq, do you think that these are a harbinger of things to come, or are these uh, anomalies? 
Yeah, you know, this is exactly what many in my field are worried about right now. We've seen the, the start of it. We've seen the random Fedayeen attacks involving suicide bombers where they've attacked U.S. Marine patrols, they've attacked U.S. Marine checkpoints. But what we actually, we're seeing a more disturbing phenomenon now beginning to emerge in Iraq. And that, that is the, what we're calling the Arab Iraqis, uh, four nationals that are entering Iraq with a desire to fight American forces and commit suicide operations against them if necessary in order to strike at America. And it's, it's quite interesting, really, because it, we're seeing uh, the mirroring of a phenomenon we saw in Afghanistan where, you know, we would have groups of uh, Afghan troops, native Afghan troops, that would be more than willing to surrender to America, more than willing to, you know, to throw down their arms. But meanwhile, they're being forced by people behind them, foreigners, foreign soldiers, basically mercenaries, forcing them to fight on. And it's, it's quite tragic, really. And are these Arab, na uh, Arab Iraqis, as you call them, these foreign nationals, are they connected to other known terrorist groups like, say, al-Qaeda or Hezbollah? Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's interesting, really, because they're tied to multiple terrorist groups. We have the, the head of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who claimed in an interview last week that there are at least 10 Islamic Jihad martyrdom cells pre-positioned in Baghdad awaiting U.S. troops. We had the same sentiments basically said by the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, who openly urged Iraqis to attack U.S. troops with suicide missions. And this is coming from a group that uh, in 1983 bombed the U.S. Marine barracks with a suicide bomber, killing 241 Marines in one act. You know, in the north, we have Ansar al-Islam with their human cruise missiles, these guys that run around with suicide belts aimed at prominent Kurdish leaders, and now probably American special forces, too. Look, I mean, the danger is definitely there. If these guys are willing to give up their lives, if they're willing these bandanas the, that we were talking about earlier, the, the, the shahadat banners, the martyrdom banners that say, I believe in nothing but God, there is only God, one God, and that is Allah. And they, they march forth into battle with this ideology. And frankly, I mean, they terrify a lot of the Iraqi troops they fight alongside. And yet, some U.S. officials have concluded that things have been quieter on the terrorism front, at least here domestically. Oh, Evan, stand by for one second. We have Greg Kelly back on the line, our embedded reporter in Baghdad. We want to go to him right now. Greg, can you hear me? I can. Is that you, Allison? We are... Uh... Right now, I'm calling you from the complex, one of the presidential uh, palaces inside the city of Baghdad. We've moved in here uh, with the Second Brigade tanks uh, just a, a short distance from me. Other tanks have seized another main palace of Saddam Hussein. Uh, there are other key uh, sites in Baghdad that are being targeted uh, and being sealed off. Uh, they're going to be stopped by the Ministry of Information resistance has been uh, rather light, actually, compared to what we've seen over the past couple of days. Uh, not too much fighting on the way in here. That skirm Those skirmishes we had two days ago uh, really cleared the way uh, for today's uh, raid into the city. Now, how long are we going to be here? We, we can't say, but uh, it looks like we could easily be setting up a base of operations uh, at this point from this, uh, from this presidential uh, palace. Uh, the palace itself seems abandoned. Uh, windows are blown out, but structurally, uh, for the most part, it is intact, as was most of the route. Uh, we were on the uh, uh, Desia Expressway uh, on the way into town. Most of the buildings on either side were... Okay, we've lost Greg Kelly for the moment, but he gave us some great information while we had him. We heard that he was calling from inside a presidential palace complex, that they had breached the presidential palace, and coalition forces were now in there securing it. He said that it looked fairly abandoned to him. Windows had been blown out. And he said that they had uh, encountered some resistance that he, I think, was describing as, as fairly light to moderate. So, as you can tell, we get Greg Kelly whenever we can, and we bring him on the air, and we'll get him back as soon as we can. Now, uh, is Evan Coleman still standing by? Okay, sorry about that, Evan. Thanks for standing <laughs> no by. Uh, what I was saying was that U.S. officials have said that things were perhaps quieter on the terrorism uh -huh. front. Than was expected. Comparatively, comparatively, I would say uh, this is you know this is when we say when we say quieter that we also have to recognize that right now we have a guy running around by the name of Adnan Shukri Juma that according to the FBI is another Mohammed Atta. 
Uh, this man was in Florida up until a few months ago, and all of a sudden we lost track of him. Uh, last week there was a, a number of serious arrests that went on in Italy where an al-Qaeda cell that actually had members of Ansar al-Islam, the, the al-Qaeda group in northern Iraq, who were uh, plotting to commit terrorist acts against Western interests in Italy. Uh, I think it's a little premature to say that the terror threat is either non-existent or, or is, uh, is somehow reduced. I would say it's very much there, and I, I think we have to remain very much on our guard. But speaking of Ansar al-Islam, that's one of the terrorist groups that has been certainly disrupted, if not rooted out. You know, uh, forces have gone in there. The 700 or so terrorists that they estimate were doing business up there, now their, uh, you know, factories or their laboratories or their, their base camp or whatever has been destroyed, no? The main training camp actually in Sargat and, and nearby south of Halabja actually has been shut down. It was bombed by B-52s and other U.S. strike aircraft. It was pretty much bombed to the ground. Unfortunately, a number of Ansar al-Islam guerrillas have escaped and are actually right now hiding out in nearby Iran. Uh, those uh, guerrillas, led by an Arab, not a Kurdish commander, by the name of Abu Abdullah al Shafi, has uh, issued a communique stating that they intend to commit upwards of 100 martyrdom operations against against the American forces in, uh, inside Iraq, actually. These guys are very, very good at this. They're, they're well-seasoned guerrillas. They're well-seasoned suicide bombers. Their threat should be taken very seriously. So is it your impression that our war on terror thus far has dismantled the terrorist apparatus in many places or not? I think in northern Iraq it certainly has. We had evidence of chemical weapons being in that camp. We had direct evidence of al-Qaeda links. And now that, that training camp is officially shut down. In fact, it's in pieces. Pho photography and video coming out of northern Iraq shows us definitively that those camps are gone. And the chemical weapons that were being made in those camps are no longer. And that's really, really important, you know. These guys may, some of these guys may still be running around and they may be threatening U.S. forces, but at least we've gotten rid of that chemical weapons laboratory. That's a real danger to the American homeland. Evan, I just want to update our viewers on what they're looking at. You can sort of see in the distance, there it comes, a plane right now that is flying over Baghdad. This is some coalition aircraft. It's flying over, and this is um, evidence of the now sort of 24-7 flyovers that coalition forces are able to do over the heart of Baghdad. Evan, back to this. Um, to your mind, has the war in Iraq awoken dormant terrorism, or was terrorism on the rise regardless? I think terrorism was on the rise regardless. Anyone that tells you that, that people in the Middle East are angry at us because of the war in Iraq, it, it misunderstands what the entire debate is about. People in, in the Middle East have been angry for a long time. This is just one factor. But I think, you know, you do have to definitely take the words of people like Hosni Mubarak, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, and even Iranian President Mohammad Hatami, who's not necessarily a friend of ours, both of whom in the last week have come out and warned that the war in Iraq will create 100 bin Ladens and that the war will result in extremist violence. But I'm afraid this is just not a threat we can back down from. If these people really are determined on targeting us, they're going to hit us whether we're fighting the war in Iraq or not. I think it just accelerates the nature of their agenda. As far as we're concerned, we should make sure to take decisive action against these groups, both where we have organized resistance to, to you know, by, by cells loyal to al-Qaeda or Saddam. We need to take the definitive action and show these terrorists that this is not going to be another Beirut. This is not going to be another Afghanistan of the 1980s. We're going to shut them down and it's, it, we're going to establish the peace in Iraq and we're not going to be deterred from it. So in other words, regardless of if the war in Iraq has sort of, uh, I don't know what Hosni Mubarak was saying, created another hundred bin Ladens, you think that it was the right thing to do? Look, I mean, Saddam Hussein is a, a tangible threat to American national security. I think there is no doubt that there is a, is a very, very strong argument for getting rid of him. I think Hosni Mubarak needs to take a look at his own policies and realize that he himself has created 100 bin Ladens with his repressive, repressive tactics against Islamist, uh, uh, Islamist opponents within, you know, political opponents, really. And I, I think Mubarak, you know, look, he may not be offering wrong advice, but I think it's advice that he himself needs to take notice of. And really all in the Middle East do, because if you look at the, the footage that's been... Uh, uh, displayed on uh, networks like Al Jazeera 
and Abu Dhabi TV, this is incitement. I mean, this is inciting people to go out and commit acts of violence. It's not news reporting, and it doesn't portray what's going on accurately. And, I mean, look, if you're going to incite people to violence, there has to be some measure of responsibility. And I really feel that many of the people that right now you see going and joining the, the legions of the Fedayeen in Iraq from outside of Iraq, these Arab Iraqis, mm -hmm. many of them are motivated by these scenes that they see on Al Jazeera. Right. Okay. Evan Coleman from the Investigative Project, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Now let's go back down to Washington and Brian Wilson. I've been uh, looking at these pictures, Allison, that you're seeing on your screen a moment ago. The unmistakable silhouette in the air of an A-10 Warthog. That is a close air support aircraft. We suspect those airplanes are flying close air support cover for the Army's third ID, units of which are now in the center of Baghdad among the people that are there with them. There again are the warthogs as they fly over downtown Baghdad. Uh, I want to point out that our Greg Kelly is with that battalion of tanks as it moves into downtown Baghdad. Uh, things are happening tonight. We have had uh, communication with Greg Kelly in the last few minutes. Uh, he, talks of, he talked uh, of being at a presidential palace, broadcasting from a presidential palace in the center of Baghdad. A tremendous amount of, uh, of stuff going on in downtown Baghdad today. According to some who have been quoted by the wire services, the other day was just a foray. This is the real thing. You don't want to turn your channel. You don't want to go anywhere. Things are happening, and we're all over it. And we'll also go to the Iraqi-Jordanian border uh, to check in again with uh, other reporters around the area. Stay with us. You're watching Fox News. doesn't sound like they're coming from, from the A-10s. No, it does not. The, the A-10, I can tell you very precisely if I heard that, it's a, it's a roar, if you will. Those are uh, either Bradley fighting vehicles or tanks. It sounded to me like the 25 millimeter guns uh, uh, from the tank, but you just, you, you can't tell for sure when listening to it this way. It, I didn't hear any main tank blast uh, as I was listening. And that sounded like a main tank blast. <laughs> Now the A-10, when it when it fires, does it fire relatively close, or does it? I mean, does it fire? It, it can fire, I guess, both with its guns and it can drop munitions as well, correct? Yeah, you know, it can. Yeah, it's got uh, again, it's got missiles it can fire, it has bombs it can drop, and it has the uh, cannon, the 30 millimeter cannon, the Gatling gun, if you will. It's uh, very high speed, found, uh, can fire on high rate up to 6,000 rounds a minute, and it's armor piercing. Uh, it's. Uh, a tremendous weapon system for close air support. And, and we are now seeing uh, the camera has turned. We're seeing uh, this black smoke uh, somewhere uh, not too far away on the horizon. Uh, not clear exactly what that is either. Uh, if you are just joining us, uh, according to Reuters, uh, uh, a column of U.S. tanks and army vehicles have launched an attack on central Baghdad. Um, and as Kathleen Koch mentioned, uh, this, this um, this major, Michael Birmingham uh, of the, the 3rd Infantry, said the other day was just an incursion. This is for real. The other day referring to uh, Saturday when the 3rd uh, Infantry uh, armored units went in, made a probing movement into, uh, into Baghdad, uh, took on a large number of Iraqi Republican Guard forces. Um, high number of casualties, uh, the numbers vary, but, uh, but a high number of casualties believed to have occurred. But according to, uh, to U.S. military spokesman, uh, th that was just an incursion. This is for real. He said, quote, we are attacking right down in the center of the city right now. Um, Anderson, a couple of other things you might watch for here. Uh, it wouldn't uh, surprise me to see uh, missiles uh, fired at the aircraft. They would normally be probably, in this case, shoulder-fired missiles, uh, SA-7s, SA-9s, SA-14s. And if that's the case, you would see the aircraft dropping flares to decoy those missiles. If any radar-guided surface-to-air missile came up, you'd likely see another aircraft not on the screen fire a homing anti-radiation missile at it. And also this aircraft has electronic countermeasures pods to decoy the missiles. And I'm hearing tank fire in the background. 
And we want to welcome our international viewers who are just joining us on CNN International. If, uh, if you are just joining us, what you are looking at is live pictures of uh, an A-10 Warthog. I believe there are two of them at least that we have seen flying over the city of Baghdad. Reuters is reporting, and uh, I'm sorry if you have been watching us for a while, I don't want to repeat myself, but if you are just joining us, Reuters is reporting that a column of U.S. tanks and armored vehicles has launched an attack on central Baghdad, referring to uh, Saturday's uh, movement of the, uh, the third infantry uh, armored units into the city. Uh, public affairs spokesman for the third infantry says the other day, that was just an incursion, this is for real. We're attacking right down in the center of the city right now. Um. A couple of other observations, Anderson. I just saw two aircraft in the picture there once. Um, a couple of other things to think about. This is exactly the situation that we saw yesterday in which a, uh, an unfortunate uh, mistake was made uh, and United States airplanes dropped on the Kurdish, uh, Kurdish allies in northern Iraq. When you are close combat with uh, enemy forces close to uh, allied forces, have got to make sure you have a forward air controller marking those targets and there's no misunderstanding. Something went wrong up there. So it's very dangerous anytime you employ aircraft close to uh, uh, close to coalition fighters, you have to be under control of a forward air controller and be very, very careful not to hit our own troops. You are? Allison, there was expected to be a huge refugee crisis here on the... All of our troops on the all of our vehicles are marked uh, with special tape on the helmets of, of every soldier on every vehicle that can be spotted from the air by our warplanes to avoid any of these friendly fire incidents. Uh, again, as you're operating in a city environment, that's something could, that could be a very real and distinct possibility. And Anderson, it's interesting, last night was the first night of this uh, so-called curfew that Iraq was imposing on the citizens of Baghdad. They were going to basically shut the, uh, the all entry points to the city down from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m. Uh, obviously not so much to keep uh, U.S. forces out, but to keep the citizens of Baghdad from fleeing. And the Pentagon response to that, uh, obviously they didn't think too much of it. They said at that point that we will operate where we want, when we want, as we want, curfew or nor no curfew. And obviously uh, we're seeing this morning that they're clearly doing just that. Well, also the Pentagon pointing out on, uh, on Sunday that in fact uh, U.S. forces and U.S.-led coalition forces control, uh, though they wouldn't say that uh, U.S. forces have surrounded the city of Baghdad. They did say that U.S. forces control uh, the, the entries to and from the city of Baghdad. It is 8.44 a.m. in Baghdad. Um, Anderson, a couple other things to consider. Uh, as I look at the sky conditions here, it's typical over a battlefield. You have lots of haze, lots of smoke on the ground. As the aircraft circle, the battle changes, vehicles move on the ground, and as Kathleen said, there are various ways of, uh, of them distinguishing our vehicles from other vehicles. It's changed on a regular basis uh, so that you don't, uh, so the enemy doesn't basically catch on. But uh, it's very, very difficult uh, for a pilot operating at altitude because he has to have standoff to employ his weapons. Very difficult for him to distinguish between vehicles. You have to be very careful, and a forward air controller has to mark the target. The pilot has to acknowledge he has it. The forward air controller has to clear him on each pass to make sure he's aimed at an enemy and not at our own airplanes. And even then, as we saw yesterday, mistakes can be made. General Shefford, uh, do you think it a coincidence that uh, just about an hour ago we were watching an unmanned uh, drone flying over Baghdad for, for quite some time? Uh, and now we are hearing uh, that there is some sort of uh, ground operation underway on the streets in central Baghdad, and now we see these A-10 uh, Warthog jets flying overhead? No, I don't think it's a coincidence at all. It's very logical. The, the Hunter drone that uh, you were observing is likely providing the low reconnaissance and uh, probably looking just ahead and see what's out in front of the, uh, the uh, coalition vehicles that are being deployed in that city probably from various routes he's looking over there uh, the commander is asking to see various routes ahead of him he's looking at the big picture the drone will likely zoom out and zoom in as they want to look at specific things above it I suspect you will find a predator flying at higher altitude and perhaps other things uh, <clears throat> as well so it's all falls into a pattern you see the hunter you 
see the other airplanes and then you hear that there's combat on the ground. And there the camera has moved. You see a plume of black smoke, smoke rising uh, behind uh, some buildings in the foreground. Uh, Kathleen Koch at the Pentagon, if you could just uh, remind us of the shift that has uh, taken place in the last 48 hours or so uh, in coalition aircraft strategies uh, over uh, the city of Baghdad as we listen to these uh, ongoing explosions right now uh, coming from central Baghdad. Or basically what they announced yesterday was th that they were starting something called close urban air support where there would be two U.S. warplanes in the skies over Baghdad 24-7 uh, on the lookout not only for targets of opportunity but up there because of moments just like this we would be beginning to have U.S. forces operating on the ground within city confines and they wanted to make sure that there were U.S. warplanes there ready at any moment to intervene if U.S. ground forces got into trouble and indeed to call in aerial reinforcements uh, as many as six other aircraft to come in, F-16s, whatever was needed to support those forces on the ground. So this is a strategy that they had been fine-tuning and are now deploying. Yeah, um, a couple of other thoughts here, uh, Anderson. Uh, you will likely see a great increase in the coming days of air cover over the city. The city will likely be sectioned up into various portions you'll have airborne uh, flights of aircraft over it at all times. Same thing, the roads north, south, east, west will be sectioned out and various sections of the road will be assigned to an airplane, uh, to a flight of airplanes that will watch that section of the road. You will also likely have forward air controllers at various uh, key points so that you really have an air occupation uh, growing over the entire uh, country. We've seen the northern watch and southern watch no-fly zones now you can basically have airplanes on call with controllers on the ground and radar airplanes such as the J-STARS that looks for movement of big columns looking over the entire country and basically it's an air occupation of a country. Let's just listen in for a few moments uh, just to the sounds of Baghdad at 8.49 a.m. on this morning and this day in the war. It sounds like things have been intensifying in the last few moments as we've been speaking. Let's just listen in. likely what many of the residents of Baghdad are hearing, whether they are hunkered down in their homes or in uh, air raid shelters, the sounds of combat somewhere in the city. We are told, the military spokesman to Reuter, quoted by Reuters, that a column of U.S. tanks and armored vehicles have launched an attack on central Baghdad. The spokesman saying we're attacking right down in the center of the city right now. The other day was just an incursion. This is for real. Yeah. Uh I'm, I'm in this digital age, uh, Anderson, I'm sitting here watching TV, listening to you, and then uh, doing the Internet, and Reuters is reporting that they're attacking the Republican uh, Palace downtown. Now, that Republican Palace, there are many palaces down there, but the Republican Palace area is uh, what we've been looking at over the past week or two. It's at about two and a half square mile area on the west bank of the Tigris River, and there are several palaces in that presidential compound. They could have... Um, is what Dave Grange is calling actionable intelligence that uh, certain people are there and they may be after someone or something uh, that they've got uh, real intelligence on. And this urban CAS or urban close air support that Kathleen was talking about is something that has been well practiced recently uh, by uh, particularly by uh, special forces and special operations from the Air Force, special forces from the Army, the uh, AC-130 gunships have been at this uh, strongly in the last uh, in the last few years and wargaming this, uh, knowing that this is a great a great possibility. So we are not we are not novices at this. Although this is the first time we have really seen it done close air support wise over a large city. We did not do close air support over Bel Belgrade during the Kosovo campaign in a large city. 
Remember, in Basra, we have been fighting a battle now for two weeks against small forces. We have two criteria. We don't want to take a lot of casualties ourselves unnecessarily. We don't want to inflict a humanitarian disaster on the city. That puts some constraints on how we can operate. That We spend time for that. They spend a lot of time in Basra, Basra over that. That's the model we're going to see here. Because remember, Tommy Franks commanded the Battle of Basra. The British were reporting to him. That's where he learned the tactics that he's going to use. And that's the only reason I'm cautioning. Be very careful about saying this is the final battle, because in Basra, we're still unfolding the end. I, I want to ask you what your greatest concern is as far as a surprise. Does, does Saddam Hussein still have a couple of tricks up his sleeve? Well, uh, my suspicion is that he may still use chemical weapons in his last moments. Uh, my concern is that he does have suicide bombers who will come out at our troops, particularly our infantry, and take them out. I'm very concerned about those oil ditches that we heard about. Uh, we just heard ex no, some information about some very large fires burning. He may be setting them off. That could create smoke that the A-10s can't see through. He can't win. The Iraqis cannot win this war. They can delay it. They can make it very uncomfortable for us, as they did in Carbella. They can hold us off for a while and cause some casualties. All right, David Friedman, Dr. David Friedman. I'm, uh, Dr. George Friedman, excuse me, my mistake. Thank you for joining us sure. from Austin, Texas. We appreciate it. Involved in um, some 28,500 air missions since the war began, a remarkable number by, by any account. General Shepard, how do you use this close air support? How do you fight in a city with aircraft, it must be an extraordinarily difficult thing to do without just incurring huge casualties. It's very difficult because there are there are several things on your mind. One is uh, not getting shot down, particularly over a heavily a heavy air defense environment like uh, like Baghdad has been. Second, you have to be on the watch all the time uh, on your radar warning gear for radar missiles. You have to watch carefully uh, for uh, uh, shoulder-fired missiles. Uh, that, by the way, was a drone that was just on there. Uh, the other thing you have to watch for is you got to be very careful that you're hitting the correct target and not our troop. And then always in your mind also is minimizing collateral damage so you're not dropping something. Now, you, the, some of that is dictated by the weapon you choose. You've got big bombs and little bombs that you can carry. And then you've got missiles that you can fire, uh, uh, infrared missiles that you can fire that home on infrared targets like a tank. And you've got the gun that can fire and be very, very accurate so you don't spray things in big bombs all over a congested area. So there's lots to think about in this urban close air support. And from the pictures we are looking at, it's difficult to tell exactly what is going on uh, in central Baghdad, in this region where we understand uh, a column of U.S. tanks and armored vehicles have launched an attack. Uh, Reuters is now reporting that two U.S. tanks have entered the presidential compound in central Baghdad. Uh, according to the Associated Press, uh, U.S. troops seized key buildings in the center of the Iraqi capital on Monday, including a major presidential palace as well as the Information Ministry. This, according to the Associated Press, reporters uh, saw the tanks roll into the heart of Baghdad on the western side of the Tigris River. Also apparently occupied this, according to the Associated Press, occupied the Al Rashid Hotel, a name uh, many have become familiar with both in this war and the last. Anderson, there's a very good example of what you were just talking about. Uh, one way to take down the El Rashid Hotel is to bomb it, and you would have killed whoever was in there, which clearly would have been some international visitors, people stay there, uh, and uh, you, you really, if the information minister had been broadcasting from there, you could have taken him out with a bomb, that's something you don't want to do. So working with close air support and Army ground forces and intelligence picked up by things such as the orbiting uh, hunters and predators, the ground forces, if all of that is correct, may have moved in and done that without destroying the building and killing a bunch of unnecessarily, unnecessarily killing a bunch of, uh, of uh, civilian not in combat. You know, and Anderson, that's an issue that the uh, U.S. military has been getting a lot of lot of flack for over the last week or so. Uh, lots of questions about why has the military not been able to take down uh, Iraqi TV? Why haven't they been able to stop these uh, these broadcasts by the Iraqi information minister? And uh, the military has said, 
we do not want to cause undue numbers of civilian casualties and we're, we're afraid we'll do just that if we try to drop a bomb right in there and so obviously what you're seeing now is them conducting more of a surgical strike going in there on the ground and occupying these and obviously hopefully saving a lot of lives on the ground So General Shepard, um, as we are hearing these reports, uh, the Associated Press now saying that U.S. troops have occupied key positions in the center of Baghdad, including both a presidential palace and the Iraqi Information Ministry. Um, we continue to look at the skies now, trying to, to see any uh, coalition aircraft uh, flying overhead. We saw the two A-10 Warthogs. Do you anticipate there are actually others out there, or, or is two uh, what would be called in for an operation like this? Um very likely that you would start out with two in an operation like this. You probably have others on call if needed. Several flights, uh, the flights can stay on station a certain period of time. Uh, those airplanes could have come out of the uh, Talil Airport that we've been talking about that was seized as a forward operating point. That would give them more orbit time over a target. So normally when these guys that we've been watching roll out of gas, you could see others uh, come in uh, from holding patterns, and there are other airplanes that you don't see airborne for sure that are supporting all this in case General Shepard, General Shepard, I'm sorry, just to, to let uh, our viewers know what we are looking at, uh, these pictures just coming in from uh, Le Lebanese Broadcasting. Uh, it appears to be uh, oil trench fire. Um, Reuters uh, is reporting, according to one of their, uh, to a witness, a Reuters witness in the city um, said that Iraqi forces lit an oil trench in the area uh, of this fighting in an apparent attempt to confuse the attackers. This witness uh, also uh, reported, this is a Reuters correspondent, uh, Samia Nakul, uh, from a vantage point in the city center, said, quote, we can see shells crashing into the palace. This is a presidential palace. White smoke is rising from the compound. There are many soldiers in the area. We can hear artillery, mortars, and probably tanks. We, uh, we are, of course, our, ourselves have heard uh, some sort of explosions that uh, sounded like artillery, sounded like mortars, uh, perhaps tank fire as well. Uh, Associated Press reporting that U.S. troops have now seized key buildings in the center of the Iraqi capital, uh, including a, a major presidential palace and the information ministry, which of course was a target of coalition airstrikes uh, over the last uh, 18 or 19 days of this conflict. AP is also saying that reporters saw tanks roll into the heart of Baghdad on the western side of the Tigris River. Also occupied was the Al Rashid Hotel. Apparently, uh, U.S. troops, again, uh, yeah, we've said that U.S. troops occupying the presidential palace as well as the Iraqi information ministry. These reports are just coming in in, in, in bits and pieces, trying to bring them to you uh, as quickly and uh, as in an organized fashion as possible. Reem, we also have uh, Reem Brahimi, uh, CNN's Reem Brahimi on the line uh, from Amman, Jordan, no doubt seeing these pictures as well. Reem, you know this area very well. Oh, she's not seeing these pictures yet. Reem, you've heard these reports. Uh, according to the Associated Press, U.S. troops occupied key positions, uh, not only a major presidential palace, but also the Iraqi Information Ministry. Certainly a major development. A very, very major development indeed, Bill. Uh, those reports of uh, armored columns coming into central Baghdad, occupying those uh, key areas. Now that area, from what I've told, I've been speaking to people in Baghdad, uh, this area is full of government buildings. Uh, it includes, as you mentioned, the information ministry. Not far from there also is the foreign ministry, um, the presidential uh, palace compound. That's not yeah, Reem, I'm sorry, we're having a very hard time hearing you. Uh, we're going to let you clear up uh, the, the phone and uh, as, as soon as you can come back to us. Uh, just having a, a technical problem there. As you continue to look at these pro these, these, this picture uh, in the lower right-hand side of your screen, what appears to be an oil trench fire uh, that has been ignited, the, the black smoke we've all come to, to know over the last 18 days or so, this in a region. There you see some tanks, two tanks off in the distance. General Shepard, can you identify? I know it's a little bit hard. Uh, the camera's now just moved off the what appears to be two tanks there. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i looking uh, at some tanks on a, what appears to be a dike there. I would assume that those are coalition uh, or uh, army tanks, U.S. Army tanks, as opposed to uh, 
close to Iraqi tanks, but I can't tell the distance that this is shooting in. If it came in closer again, I probably could. Yeah, Reuters is saying that at least 25 tanks and a similar, and a similar number of fighting vehicles from the 2nd Brigade of the 3rd Infantry Division uh, thrust into the south of the city via Highway 8 early on Monday. Um, this, according to U.S. military spokes, uh, sources, telling Reuters correspondent Luke Baker, uh, the column apparently in the central Al Kark neighborhood near the city's main racetrack and near one of President Saddam Hussein's city palaces. Uh, this, according to to, uh, to Reuters sources, and uh, and the U and the source also said that the U.S. Vance was receiving close air support, which would of course jibe with what we have been seeing in the skies over Baghdad. Those two A-10 Warthog planes circling overhead had to take steps and we're going to have to take more steps. And if we're not going to be victims anymore and we're not going to be passive, if that's what we were before September 11th, does that mean that now all countries who may harbor terrorists um, are now on our hit list? I'm not sure they're on our hit list. I'm sure they're on our list of, of places we're concerned about and that we're going to take proactive action, whether that action is diplomatic, whether that action is, is trade sanctions. Uh, we're not going to wait for the shoe to drop, and I think the same thing is true at home. That we're uh, we're you know we're not only much more vigilant, but we're out there looking for people who mean us harm because the terrible secret that we that we began to understand on September 11th is that there are people who can be living very quietly among us who are waiting to spring into action. And what worries me about what's going on overseas is that even as we as we roll up these terror organizations on the other side of the world uh, they will have already planted people here and that's why we're on orange alert that's why we're doing all kinds of very specific things when we're on an orange alert and what i try to explain in the book are the ways in which that's made us stronger the ways in which we're still vulnerable and most of all it's a story of people really doing a lot of things to make us safer uh, making a lot of tough decisions. Sometimes they make the wrong decisions. Uh, uh, more often than not, they're making the right decisions. But they are standing up. They're not simply saying, well, this bad thing happened to us. You know, we hope something else doesn't happen to us. Okay, Stephen Brill, author of After, How America Confronted the September 12th Era. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Let's go back down to Washington and Brian Wilson. As we continue to look at pictures from Lebanese TV that show a lot of activity in the center of Baghdad, just a very brief recap. The Army's 3rd ID has entered the central part of Baghdad, has taken one of Saddam Hussein's presidential palaces in the center of the city. Uh, there are smoke fires that have been lit. Uh, U.S. tanks have been seen, and there has been some fighting, although it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been reported to be light to heavy, depending on the location. More heavy downtown. Our Greg Kelly in the thick of things, also monitoring the situation from the Pentagon. Mike Emanuel. Mike, what are you hearing over there? Well, Brian, we've been asking folks here at the Pentagon if this is the battle for Baghdad. Some here suggesting that basically this is a planned operation, that they had military objectives they wanted to achieve, uh, that this is also a psychological operation, basically trying to convince the people of Baghdad that Saddam Hussein's regime is going down and that coalition forces, coalition forces can basically come and go as they please going into the heart of Baghdad. Uh, of course, you know, the Iraqi people have uh, seen a lot of these taped uh, presentations of Saddam Hussein on television in recent days or, or have been made aware that Saddam Hussein is appearing on television, that there have been read messages from Saddam Hussein on Iraqi television. Uh, and so basically the coalition wants to convince these, convince these people who have been living under uh, Saddam Hussein's dictatorship for so many years in, in fear for so many years that his days are numbered, his regime is going down, and here are our tanks in broad daylight going through downtown Baghdad, and they feel like that that kind of message, uh, you know, conveyed through word of mouth through the Iraqi people will certainly help the operation and convince people that uh, they don't have to live in fear any longer. Uh, so is this the battle for Baghdad? Uh, nobody wants to say for sure on the record. Some people say uh, perhaps it is the battle for Baghdad. Uh, and that once they are firmly in control of the city, then they'll come out and say, well, we just had the battle for Baghdad and we won. Uh, so at this point, we're getting mixed messages here. Nobody wanting to say for sure 
that this is the battle for Baghdad, but they say that there is a lot to be gained by our forces being on the ground in Baghdad, uh, for one, convincing the Iraqi people that Saddam Hussein and his regime's days are numbered. Brian? Uh, Mike, uh, we are quoting someone who is apparently in Baghdad or near Baghdad. The wire services are saying that the other day, I guess it was Saturday, was just a foray, and he goes on to say, this is the real deal. This incursion is for real. Uh, what do you make of that statement? Well, Brian, we've been told here at the Pentagon to trust what the embedded reporters are telling us that what they're seeing was going to be real-time action and that what they were reporting would be probably the best information we could get. Greg Kelly's telling us that he's in the heart of Baghdad, he's in a presidential compound. Uh, that speaks volumes here at the Pentagon. That means that this is pretty serious if, if they really have gone into the heart of Baghdad. And so perhaps the information, or, or without a doubt, the information that we're getting from Greg and perhaps uh, Colonel Oliver North and perhaps Rick Leventhal at this hour is the best information we can go with. Uh, but it certainly sounds like this is the real deal, that there are some serious operations going on on the ground in Baghdad and that perhaps this is the battle to take out Saddam Hussein's regime and convince everybody inside Iraq that it's over for Saddam and his henchmen. All right, Mike Emanuel, once again, we're going to monitor what's going on with our sister news operation, Sky News. Correspondent David Chater is in downtown Baghdad. We may mix the pictures up, but you'll be listening to the voice of David Chater and the anchors of Sky News as you look at pictures from Lebanese TV. Let's listen in on the bridges and secure a crossing, uh, a bridgehead across to the uh, eastern side of the Tigris where I am at the moment. And uh, they'll have to do that perhaps in the next few hours. Perhaps this is the beginning of the end for the battle of control in the center of Baghdad. Or it might be another one of these occasions where they decide that uh, they don't have enough forces to hold back any reinforcements, any counterattack. They've demonstrated what they can do. Maybe they'll spend a few hours here, keep the defenders at bay, and then withdraw under the cover of their, their air cover back to their positions surrounding the whole of the capital at the moment. But judging by the sound of that firefight, uh, the smoke drifting above me at the moment. Uh, there's a fierce fight going on. Perhaps they might even be trying to go across the bridges, or maybe there's a counterattack going in across the bridges. But this is a pretty exposed position. There's smoke everywhere now. Uh, you begin to see it billowing behind me, perhaps, if you can move slightly. It's really blowing in now. It's really getting dark here. This is the smoke from the oil reservoir they've ignited. Uh, the smell of cordite as well, the smell of explosives mixed with that. You can hear the firefight going on at the moment. I don't know whether that's the Americans skirmishing forward or the uh, counterattackers going in to try and take on the armored column. Um, literally there you see the fog of war in front of you. The sound of jets, the sound of airstrikes going in as well at the moment. Very difficult to, uh, for me to see what's going on, but there's an awful lot that I can hear at the moment. And it's right next to me. And uh, it does sound like there's a fierce firefight going on at the moment. Maybe it isn't a counterattack, an attempt by the Iraqi defenders of the city to, to take on the tank column. It does sound like a firefight going on there at the moment. It's not just Kalashnikovs, not just uh, light rounds, weapons rounds or machine guns. Some pretty heavy caliber machine guns now being used. Uh, a few hundred yards away from me, I think, aimed out at the armored column, but perhaps also it might be this way. So perhaps it might be wise for me pretty soon to take cover. Uh, David, uh, of course, uh, do that as soon as you feel it's appropriate. We're just hearing from the Pentagon there. They will not confirm that this is the battle for Baghdad, but U.S. officials have declared Baghdad cut off from the rest of Iraq. I don't really need to tell you that, do I? Well, no, just take a look around you, take a look at what's happening here. The smoke is uh, enveloping the whole of this building. I can now hardly see what's happening across the, uh, across the bank of the, uh, the Tigris River, but there are American tanks there. There's an awful lot happening here. There's a, there's a little wind whipping up the dust as well, just to add to the sense of confusion, the sound of gunfire, heavy rounds. Uh, it might be the case that uh, the Iraqi defenders on this side of the uh, Tigris are bringing up uh, reinforcements and pouring in fire against that column of armored uh, American armor on the opposite side of the bank to us. But uh, 
you've got reports that they've taken over the presidential complex a few hundred yards from where I stand. They've taken over the Ministry of Information where I report from. Both of those areas uh, can control the approaches to bridges across the Tigris River to the eastern bank where I'm standing. So uh, a crucial part of the city to control. And once you can cross those bridges and establish um, a presence, an armed presence here, an armed presence here, then you've essentially taken hold and a grip on the very centre of power, the very centre of Baghdad itself. David, we can hear a lot of uh, chatter behind you. Is that, would you describe it as panic or, or anger? No, that's just um, up here like me trying to uh, work out what's happening. Um, it could be pretty exposed here, and uh, I don't think, frankly, Simon, it's wise for me to carry on uh, talking to you here anymore. There is a large battle going on right next to me, and uh, I think I better David, start go. taking cover. David, you go and your team go. Thank you for bringing us up to date. We'll uh, be talking to you later. Well, you've been watching our sister news operation, Sky News, and correspondent David Shader, who in his uh, characteristically understated British way, talking about the battle that is going on near him. Apparently, he feels at this time it's time for him to abandon that position. We certainly understand that. Tremendous pictures of downtown Baghdad. Recap a couple of things have crossed the wires in the last few minutes. According to Colonel David Perkins. He apparently told his troops before the operation began that the mission was intended to be, quote, a dramatic show of force. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to stop what we're doing. Greg Kelly's on the video phone. Greg, what can you tell me? Roger, coming. Greg hey, Kelly? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, Colonel Perkins is right. This was a dramatic show of force. Are you with me? Fix the camera. We're on right now. Okay, here's the, here's the deal. We are at Saddam Hussein's main palace in the city of Baghdad. We got here uh, about 40 minutes ago. Troops are in there right now securing uh, this main presidential palace in downtown Baghdad. We came in early this morning, uh, roughly uh, about 6.30 or so. There are other units now securing other key points in this city, both symbolic and strategic in nature. Uh, the presidential reviewing stand is under uh, uh, is basically surrounded by the 3rd Infantry Division, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, another presidential palace in Baghdad, also surrounded, as this one is. Troops now going through room to room, searching it. As we came in here, not much resistance uh, to our armed convoy. We actually were inside the palace itself uh, about 20 minutes ago. We went up to about the uh, second floor, uh, scouted out a little, a little bit. There's a lot of debris in there. Uh, this thing was clearly hit in a coalition airstrike, maybe the first one on that Wednesday some two and a half weeks ago. Uh, a lot of debris, but generally the building is intact and it is uh, quite an ornate scene. Uh, marble floors, tiles uh, on the top. We have um, uh, gold chandeliers. Colonel Perkins, do me a favor, can you come here for a second? This is Colonel David Perkins, 2nd Brigade Commander. Sir, you, uh, you brought the team here. We've got this uh, palace apparently surrounded. What else is going on and what does it mean? Uh, we have uh, one company from a, uh, a tank battalion here. What we have in the city now is the entire armor brigade. Uh, we have the rest of the, this battalion is securing this palace as well as one further down the road, the 14 July monument. We're securing the bridge that goes over the peninsula where a lot of the high officials uh, reside in a lot of reinforcements for coming over. Uh, I have another battalion who's securing the rest of the center of the city, the al Rashid Hotel, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the parade field, the VIP seating area, et cetera, like that, and all the major governmental buildings. So right now, we really have control of the center of Baghdad and what is the heart of his uh, governmental structure. You have control of the city. Uh, are we going to stay here? We'll continue to develop the situation. We'll see what our tactical requirements are and how they fit into the overall situation. There's a lot of ways that we can control this ground. There's a lot of ways we can control uh, entrance and exit. And so there's a, uh, many things that will go into that decision. We will probably continue to move around, not be stationary, uh, so that... Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving situation. You were probably the first American commander inside Saddam Hussein's presidential palace. Uh, what are you thinking? I'll tell you, it is a testament to the American soldier what they have done to get here. We have been fighting nonstop contact for about the last 17 days, moved five to 600 miles with all these vehicles, uh, sustained uh, numerous casualties, uh, overcome just uh, almost insurmountable odds, crossing uh, the Euphrates multiple times, moving all the equipment, through fairly uh, untrackable terrain, and now you can see uh, a bunch of American soldiers uh, standing at the entrance of the palace. Uh, I think it's a testament to the capability of the United States Army. Do you feel like we 
won at this point, or is victory uh, still a couple of days away? How close are you to wrapping this thing up? Tactically, we obviously have uh, crushed his armed resistance, and, and the American soldier has been victorious from that point of view. There's obviously a lot of uh, political um, uh, restructuring that has to occur. Our desire is that by us now occupying the city, we're already working with the locals to show that we don't mean them any harm, we want to get the city back up and running, that they will see that we are here for their benefit, and the sooner the Iraqi people uh, take control of their own country and get things back up and running, I think that will define total victory. Well, it's amazing to be talking to you, Colonel, from uh, Saddam Hussein's front yard, literally his front yard. That's where we're coming to you from. As the Colonel said, uh, other elements of the brigade are securing other key sites in this city. Uh, it's a whole new war. Guys? Greg, let me ask you about the trip in. Talk about what you saw, talk about the fighting you experienced, and tell me what's going on around you now. The trip in, we met some resistance, but it was uh, fairly moderate compared to what we saw two days ago and what we've seen in the past. Uh, some of our forward elements were heavily engaged. Sir, any more on the trip in here? It seemed like, uh, compared to what we've seen before, it wasn't as bad. I, I think we're just getting sensitized to bad. Um, as you know, we were shot at multiple times with RPGs. What we found, though, was that uh, we had come in the other day and started to clear the route and really set the conditions to come in here. He had come back and uh, reinforced that. We saw new minefields across the highways, had dug up the highways with tank ditches, had dug new fighting positions, new anti-tank positions, and had strengthening positions that previously weren't strengthened. So he clearly did not want us here today. He, he knew that we were going to come back, uh, but obviously his efforts failed. And again, the American soldier has proven uh, his capability. Now, the situation here feels fairly secure, but there's still a lot of firing going on a little bit closer to downtown. Uh, tanks are still engaged. Uh, what is their status right now? Again, when you say fairly secure, we've come to mean that no one is shooting within 10 feet of you, I guess, is secure. You can hear the artillery, the uh, close air support going off, and the tanks. We still have uh, resistance throughout the city, and that's exactly what we're doing now. We're taking our armored forces and pushing all the way through and completely securing this so that we have freedom of maneuver within the city, and more importantly, uh, that we then can allow the city to get back to normal operations. All right, Colonel Perkins, thank you very much. I think Captain Ives uh, needs you over there. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, astounding to be coming to you from uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, own house, at least one of them. He has 8 to 12 uh, throughout the country and uh, multiple uh, sites in Baghdad, but this is one of the main presidential palaces, uh, very close to downtown, right off, uh, I'm sorry, good to see uh, Expressway, uh, one of the main thoroughfares in Baghdad. Brian? <laughs> Greg, uh, just one quick question, and I'm going to let Allison Camerata jump in here for a couple of questions. Uh, you, how long do you think you can stay there no, and no, keep no. operating? That's a good question. We asked uh, the colonel. He said that uh, that depends on uh, uh, basically higher headquarters and, and their desire. Uh, but it looks like we could stay here for quite a while. We do have a lot of tanks, a lot of Bradley fighting vehicles. We have set up. Uh, other permanent positions with less than this before. Uh, I have a feeling the intent might be to stick around and uh, secure a supply train uh, through uh, the route that we just came up uh, so we can get supplies and ammunition and that kind of thing uh, and an air of permanence. Uh oh, we have lost our signal. Still going no, room back. to room in there. It's back.